Good uh, morning, um, colleagues. It is my pleasure to invite you here today for a special occasion. Usually we meet for uh, lectures and for discussion, but today is a combined occasion. As you know, it is a very special day for YASA. It is a day where there is a memorial service and uh, service uh, to remember the great contribution that Professor Howard Reifer made to the uh, world of decision science, not only at YASA, but uh, at other places he was working. We gather together uh, with all of you uh, to go through the following program. We will start with uh, a little remembrance of Howard Reifer again here at YASA and his role he had for YASA, not only by me, but uh, by Howard Rohreiter, who is here, who was actually the one who was hired by Howard, uh, Howard here at YASA and Joanne. After that, um, we will have a little break, sandwich, lunch, and then we move to the lecture, which will be given on the topic of today. So let me just uh, briefly go back and to talk to Professor Howard Treifer. As you know, when he passed away, we had already a small remembrance here and we were remembering uh, his uh, personality, his expertise, his contribution, and his fundamental role for this institute. I think I am not overstating when I say again, if there was not Howard Treifer, they would not be YASA today. Today, at uh, six o'clock in the evening, at Harvard Business School, there will be a special ceremony where 12 speakers will be addressing Harvard's Rafa contribution to the decision science globally. On the ASA behalf, Professor Nakicenovic, Naki will be there speaking about seven minutes about very difficult subject, what Harvard Rafa means and meant to YASA and what he means and meant to him, because Naki was also the one of the first uh, highlights of Howard Reifer here at the Institute. There is also Maggie Collins. She helped a lot to organize uh, the whole happening, and she's also involved very much in uh, the program of uh, today at Harvard Business School. Many of us cannot be there, including myself, because uh, I have to be here today. We are hosting, as you probably know, this afternoon and tomorrow, important meeting of the science advisors to the foreign ministers, including Secretary of State John Kerry, science advisor, for next two days. So it keeps me here. But I think all of us will be there also in our spirit and in our thinking about not only Howard, but everything he did and um, he did for this institute. I met Howard Reifer quite late in my career. I met him actually here, because I knew Howard Reifer and his books, but I met him actually here in October 2012. You may remember we had a 40th anniversary conference of YASA. It was in Hofburg, and I decided uh, to invite all directors of YASA who still were alive at the time to come over here. And they all came, at least who were alive, and their partners, their wives, I remember we were waiting in Elizabeth's room for Howard Reifer to come. And then I stood up and I went out and I look into this long corridor, which I see when you go out from the Elizabeth room. And I saw him coming on the wheelchair together with Judy, his daughter, and uh, Estella, his wife, approaching the Elizabeth room. Where already a number of us were, including some of the past directors. He entered the Elizabeth room and it changed immediately the atmosphere. There was so much emotion, positive emotion. There was so much hugging, real men hugging. There were tears. Not only tears on the sides of those who hugged him. I looked at him a couple of times, and he was hardly able to cover his own emotion. He was back at his yasa. And then we discussed and talked, and he was signing his books to many of us. And then we went for a picture, picture in front of... Uh, Maria Theresia, this classical picture which you do in these occasions in the Elizabeth room. So we gathered, former directors and current director, me, new director at the time, just for six months, and the partners. And then Estella, actually Judy, his daughter, was driving his wheelchair to this picture. And there is this moment which I would uh, remember for my life, shivering moment. He pushed her away, and he stood up. He said, I am going to stand up for my ass. And that picture is having our driver standing, not on the wheelchair. And I see this is something which was so symbolic, so typical. He was standing on his own legs for Yasa. And that picture is one of the most valuable ones we have. It has been shown many times here. 
It's on the website, and I'm very thankful that this moment happened to Yasa, that he was here with us, showing his devotion, showing his thinking about Yasa. Judy, his daughter, she was communicating with us, with me, and with Naki for the last couple of months intensively. She said that during his last period of his life, he was remembering Yasa very often. He was talking about Yasa. He was hoping that Yasa will be able to remain successful. He was proud of Yasa. And I'm also proud to tell you that after some discussions, we decided that we will start at Yasa a new program named after our Trifa, not the real program in the sense of Yasa programs, but a program which will be called Our Trifa Decision Science Fellows Program. It will be announced today at Harvard by Naki on our behalf. I'm also proud to tell you that there is a lot of traction already. Some of his former students are putting money on the back to be able to actually pay for it. So there will be something which will be lasting memory of Howard Raifa at Yasa. We will discuss it internally, and I think this is very important. I'm proud that we can do this together with the family, together with uh, our colleagues at Harvard Business School and Kennedy Schools. We will be pushing this ahead as 1st of January 2017 then. Who was Howard Raifa a scientist? Howard Raifa preferred books rather than papers because he said he could express himself much, much better than in the paper. And we all know what it, what, what it means, right? To have a book or to have a couple of pages to tell something. He was the one who was provoking the purist already in the 50s of last century. He was trying to redefine the statistics to the thing which what he called decision, decision, decision science. Usually the purist, I'm also one of those who were brought like a purist, at least in my first math course, we use the statistics as a statistics numbers. You do the average, and that's the average. You do the statistics on the data, and you come out with the average. What he did was different. He said there is something which is a signature in those who are entering statistics. The agents are not only numbers, but they have a history. They may have been thinking about, they have been brought up differently in their family. So there is this part of the uncertainty which is more than the numbers, more than the puristic statistics. This is basically a most simple way how to describe his contribution to the world. So all this game type of decision theory thinking came actually after this pre-assumption. It was not easy. Certainly not because he was also the one who didn't like to stay in the nice Harvard uh, room to just write the books. He wanted to do the science for solutions. He wanted really to do the science for solutions, and his last words, as you remember, at least he spoke to us during this video message last year during the system conference. He said that he would like to see us uh, to do more for the real world, to actually come to solutions, to come to decisions, to come to options, not to just endlessly discuss, but actually to decide based on the very uncertain information. This, this was our trifle. This brought him to the number of um, discussions which were complicated at the time. He had a lot of resistance, but in the end, uh, he marked the field by this new approach very strongly then. He has written uh, six books. We have them, all of them in our library. I would like to ask you to look for them because it's all exciting reading. It's difficult to reading too, because uh, those who are brought up as the mathematicians always miss something, because there is this perception about uh, footprint in our minds, which needs to be also somehow parameterized, or parameterized, yet another word of mathematician, done something with it to be able to include it in the uncertainty discussion. So please, uh, if you have a chance, take them one by one and read those, because it's really a formative process to read such a book. He was also a nice man, gentleman. I mean gentleman. That means gentleman, right? He was really inclusive. He was loved by staff. Sometimes I look at him and I think, well, I'm actually jealous at you because you were so much love with staff. I have to do so, so difficult job here. No, I'm joking, of course. I'm also hopefully being popular here. He didn't make distinction between a um, secretary, cleaning lady, and his research hires, these were all valuable people. This is what is the biggest value of it. Inclusiveness, human face, not to push but convince, internalize in a way that there is a respect for the players in the room. And I think this is his biggest value. I think this is the reason he was really loved 
as an expert, but also as a human being. And this is, I think, where we all at YASA are so much proud to be able to carry on with his heritage. Let me now invite uh, Joanne, Joanne Bayer. Joanne was uh, one of the first hires of YASA, but of Howard Reif, and she will probably share with us her personal story. Joanne. Thank you, Pavel. Thank you. And thank you all for, for coming. I, I see a lot of young faces in the, in the audience who probably didn't personally know Howard or here, but who is here that actually was here when Howard was or have, knew him? I know Yuri. Yuri, you, you must be one of those persons, right? Jerry? No? Didn't know Howard. And Gunter, huh? Yeah. I mean, certainly if you want to say something where we're finished, you know, please come up and... and, and Put in a word. Um, it, it's really, for me, uh, such an honor to talk about Howard because, uh, because he was really such a forceful person for my career. And even without having a whole lot of contact, even if you had a small amount of contact with Howard, somehow it stayed with you. you know, he was that kind of a person. And my few words here is really a personal history. I'm not going to talk so much about the science. Um, although certainly that is a part of the personal history. But my, my connection with Howard started before I ever came to IASA, before I knew Howard Rafa. Uh, I was a, a graduate student in, in Washington. I had a summer job at the Department of Transportation. And at the Department of Transportation, and also in my graduate studies, I got really interested in how do you value safety. Uh, because, of course, Department of Transportation had to do that, and they would put a value, did their cost-benefit analyses, put a value on human life. And I got to thinking about it and thought, you know, it's, it's odd about safety because, uh, you know, there was this kind of classic problem around uh, where, you know, Russian roulette, where somebody has a, a gun that has six places for bullets <laughs> aimed at you and is going to pull the trigger. And if there's six bullets in the gun, how much are you willing to pay to take out one? Is probably much higher than when there's only one bullet in the gun. And so I, I got interested in this. Why, why, why this dislinearity? And somehow, and I don't know how it happened, but something came on my desk at the Department of Transportation, and it was just a manuscript. And it was a manuscript by Pratt, Rafa, and Schleifer. Uh, on kind of statistical decision making. And I got so into that <laughs> book. And I can tell you it didn't answer my puzzle. I answered that later to myself, but it didn't answer my puzzle because frank utility theory can't explain that. Um, but it really got me interested in subjective probability. And my story with Howard picks up really very much on what Pavel said, that Howard was a person that went beyond numbers to people. And he was also a person with strong commitment. And those are the two things which Pavel said and I, I would like to pick up on. But um, going beyond the numbers, you know, it was the, my first introduction to subjective probability, my first introduction to Bayesian probability, and to, as Pavel was saying, you know, you can't just take the statistics, that we bring something. We bring something into that decision context, that there's a human element to it. And so, uh, I was kind of working on my dissertation, thinking about it in these terms. Um, I came to Yasa not because of Howard Rafa. I hadn't met Howard Rafa. Uh, I came to Yasa because I, I met a guy who told me, teach me how to ski, and I thought, great. And then I was in Vienna, and I found out that they were creating this institute. Um, and so, you know, I, this is not a story about me, but I was found myself at IASA, and I found myself uh, at one point. I had never met the director. I was I was at IASA as a research assistant, and I had never met Howard Rafa. But I found myself at a Horiga, and this is so typical IASA. You know, such a mix up, mixing at, at Horigas, and I was sitting at one of these benches, and Howard Rafa was kind of making his rounds around the tables, and he sat down, and I thought, well, I probably have three minutes with Howard Rafa. And I told him a little bit about my dissertation. And he said, oh, I'm so interested in that. And then Howard's going to talk, Kuhnorth is going to talk a little bit about deliberative and intuitive thinking. And in a very strong moment of fast intuitive thinking, uh, which I thought later I might, have re might regret, but I didn't, I said, oh, would you be on my dissertation committee? 
you know, uh, I'm at the University of Maryland, he's at Harvard, and right now he's at IASA. And this was so typical Howard. Howard said, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and then he said, I have to move on. And off he went. And I went, oh, okay. Um, yeah. And I thought, well, uh, so I thought, well, was he just, you know, had too much to drink? Had I had too much to drink? Uh, so I dared to make an appointment with him some weeks later and thought, you know, does he remember me? Does he remember this horror again? I went in and uh, of, of course he remembered me and of course he remembered that and of course he was going to be on my committee. And, uh, and it turned out he'd gone back to Howard when I, Harvard when I finished my thesis and so I wrote him, not an email at that time, I probably wrote him a letter. Uh, saying, you know, the dissertation will be scheduled for this and this time, you know, do you still want to be on the committee? And he, I can't remember exactly the correspondence, but he did say, you know, basically he was going to do this on his own expense and he was going to come down. You know, that was the person he was. Absolute commitment, um, you know, and so I told my professor at, at Maryland, he said, oh my goodness, oh, big day, big day. And of course, in the end, they paid him to come down and it was all about Howard Rafe and very little about my dissertation defense <laughs> in the end, <laughs> which was good for me. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, so um, that was my experience with Howard Rafe. The next experience really I had with him was many, many years later when he was starting up a, um, a a program here on processes of international negotiations. And he had gotten a, a, some foundation funding for that program, and he came to Yasa. Tom Lee was at that time the director, and he didn't really have anybody to put into place to kind of get things going till he, they could recruit a, a real leader for this, so he asked me if I would do it. And uh, I was very pleased to do it, although I knew nothing about negotiations. Um, <clears throat> but, of course, I, I, I learned something and a great deal about negotiations. And one thing I learned, um, I, I, well, one thing, I mean, a major thing I learned is that it's all not, it's, it's not about, you know, it's not about a zero-sum game. It's not a I win, you lose in a negotiation. But if you don't get the mindset that it's a win-win in some way, you know, you can just not go into the negotiation. And so that has... That has stayed with me, and a lot of the work we do now, and I'll come back to that, is about how you get to that kind of compromise, to that mutual agreement with the stakeholder work that we do. Very much inspired by that early work that was inspired by Howard Rafa. And also what changed my career was really wanting to move and really work in real environments with, you know, quote, real people, the real world. And this is a quote from Howard Rafa's book on art and art and science of negotiation, where he says, quite literally, I began by studying loads of case studies of real world problems. Practically every case I looked at included an interactive, competitive decision component. But I was at a loss to know how to use my expertise as a game theorist. And I, I look a little bit at off on this because it's a little bit of that, that quote which is underlying so much of the work that we're doing right now in our governance crosscut on bringing the game theorists together with the cultural theorists. And all of that cultural theory is based so strongly on subjective probability and the ideas that came out of Howard Rafe who said, you know, we have to understand people and what they want, and the game theory, and the cultural theory really goes behind that and says, here's some ways we might understand preferences and what goes behind those utility theory ideas. And I'm quite sure Howard would be extremely in inspired and interested in how that's, that work is right now uh, moving forward. Um, yeah, so I, I think I just want to come back that Howard was a person so much of the humans behind the numbers, so important to Yasa's work today, and so much a person of commitment, committing at that time to a young person, research assistant who he met five minutes at a horiga, and actually staying with it, coming at his, you know, agreeing to come at his own expense three years later, yeah, and truly as a human person, human being, you know, just, you know, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm going to start in tears, so I'm going to stop, but I'm going to quite appropriately hand this over right now to 
Howard Kuhnrother, who I'm not going to introduce because Pavel will be introducing him for his lecture, but I will say that Howard Kuhnrother ranks along Howard Rafa <laughs> in inspiring me, and I know that Howard Kuhnrother has the same, con even maybe more so connection with Howard Rafa, so I think it's quite appropriate that he end this right now with his story. Thank you very much, Joanne, and thank you, Pavel and Joanne, for the beautiful talks that either, both of you gave about Howard Rafa. Uh, I'm really honored to be here at YASA and honored to honor Howard Rafa, who really was responsible for me coming here. Uh, I was here 35 years ago, or 36 years, or 1980. I was professor at the Wharton School, and Howard Rafer and I had known each other, not all that well at the time, but well enough for Howard to say, you must come to Yasa. And I said, well, what is Yasa about? And he described essentially this as an international institute that brought top researchers together and uh, that this would be a place where I'd have the freedom to do work of my own interests, but also tied in with the interests of Yasa. And I knew several people who had been to Yasa, David Bell, Ralph Keeney, Detlof von Winterfeld, all people who I've continued to know over the years and talked briefly with them, and they had a, had a wonderful experience coming at an early stage. And so I came here, and I met Joanne. <laughs> and we worked on risk together over the years. We worked on a project of siting liquefied natural gas facilities in four different countries, something we could never have done any other place except Yasa, where we were viewed as a neutral party, able to get data on how they were dealing with their siting decisions. We continue to work over the years. I must say, I'm, I'm co-director of the Wharton Risk Center uh, at, the, at the Wharton School, and we have had an association with Yasa for the 30 years that we have been actually in business, and we are working very closely today with uh, people here in the room, Reinhardt and, and uh, Adriana and others who are associated with a Zurich project on floods around the world, and a project also related to a drought that farmers are facing and how the role of insurance can play, or the role that insurance could play in dealing with that. So really there has been a continuity and Howard really was the responsible person for dealing with that. Now I'd like to just relay a couple of stories, personal stories about How uh, Howard that I thought you might not have heard before uh, that relate uh, uh, to the way he dealt with people and the way his concern with people and his intensity in wanting to be with people. He had this enormous interest, as you heard from Pavel and from Joanne, in really trying to deal with the real world and social welfare, and we got him involved in the risk project and invited him to several con conferences and he would come when he was available and always was there. He never ever left the room unless there was a break. He was with you the entire time just wanting to be part of whatever was happening and always paying attention to others. But there was one time that he did leave the room in a rather sudden manner. A fire alarm went off at Yasa in the middle of a conference and a workshop that Joanne and I were together at with Howard. And Howard, this was on the first floor of the Schloss, Howard jumped out the window. <laughs> Never ever forgotten that. He said, we gotta get out of here. And he jumped out the window. A few of us followed him, but a number of us went around the room and exited in the right way. And he basically uh, set the tone for how we behaved. And uh, that was an image that I will never ever forget. That was the one time that he left the room uh, in a precipitous manner. The other story that I will relay really relates back to some remarks that Pavel and Joanne were making, and in particularly, Pavel, your comments with respect to uh, his interest in statistics, but also subjective probability, and Joanne's point that uh, Howard always wanted to sort of think about 
uh, how people deal with uncertainty and probability. His Bayesian view of the world, which really su sort of suggested that people may have subjective probabilities that may differ from the actual ones, and their own experience would actually be part of that. So I was at lunch, this is after I came back from Yasa, I was lu at lunch with Howard uh, and a few other people at Harvard. We were sitting around the room talking about risk, which Howard had an interest in, and he yeah, and, and got into the notion of food, food risks of food substances. And one of the people at the table uh, said that they really were not going to ever use saccharin because they were concerned with the risks associated with saccharin. So Howard asked the following question. Do you have a smoke alarm to this person? And the person said, no. And then he said, well, why are you worried about saccharin? <laughs> and there was this strange silence in the room because we, everyone was trying to make the connection between the smoke alarm and saccharin. But of course, Howard had the connection uh, and basically said, look, you have to look at the risks. You have to look at the likelihood of something happening to you. And you have to look at the consequences. And if you don't have a smoke alarm, then you, why, why are you worried about saccharin? And it was a beautiful example of the whole notion of risk perception that we have, where we put things in different buckets and can think about kind of the saccharin in the same category as a smoke alarm. But at the end of the day, at that lunch, Howard won the day. Everyone recognized that there was another element that needed to be considered on the science and the policy and the notion of really looking at perception and risk assessment. So I've never forgotten that story as well. Uh, I will say here in closing that Howard has left a legacy for all of us with his wisdom, concern about real world issues of importance, reflecting them in a meaningful way. And therefore, I want to let you know that my talk this afternoon, which will be related to risk and climate change and flooding, is really a tribute to Howard Rafer. I'm honored to be here and I'm particularly honored to be able to give the talk as a tribute to him. So I look forward to being part of this. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, um, Joanne, for this um, not only personal emotional, but also actually nice scientific stories to explain what the heritage of Rafa was in terms of his thinking as a scientist. I was thinking um, myself what to do now. Of course, we have been uh, sitting in the same room when he Rafa passed away, and we have been uh, thinking of him in memory, having one minute of silence. And I don't think we should do it this time because we have done it already before. And I think there is a heritage of Howard, which will stay with us in terms of science and this human being. So let me make a suggestion. I will take up this mobile phone, which like email didn't exist when he was uh, here, of course. I'm going to master it if I can, because I'm very bad in these things, to get it to the stopwatch. Let me see if I can do it. Stopwatch, where is stopwatch? Well, OK. I have a stopwatch. And I'm going to set it off for one minute. Ask you to stand and to do for Howard. One minute, Lord applause, clapping your hands, thanking him for everything he did. So one minute goes on now. Thank you. I'm absolutely sure that Howard is hearing this. Thank you very much. Have a nice lunch. And I think, Joe, and we just have a break for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Break.